Okay, so welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to do is discuss voltage-gated potassium channels. Okay, right. So I'm going to begin by uh, giving an outline as to what we're going to talk about in this video. So firstly, what we're going to start off with is a discussion of the action potential, which is a key physiological phenomenon that voltage-gated potassium channels play an incredibly important role in. Okay, so we're going to motivate our in-depth discussion of voltage-gated potassium channels with that, that uh, key function in the action potential. Okay, so we'll start off by discussing the action potential. Then what we'll do is we'll look at the structure of voltage-gated potassium channels in a lot of detail. Okay, we'll see how they are tetramers and we'll have a look at the structure of the individual subunits of voltage-gated potassium channels. Then what we'll move on to is the gating mechanism, so how a, a depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is going to lead to um, the activation of these voltage-gated potassium channels, the opening of that pore for potassium to move through. Okay, and then finally what we will do, well actually not finally, um, then what we will do is we will look at uh, the mechanisms underlying the selectivity of voltage-gated potassium channels. Okay, so voltage-gated potassium channels are very selective for potassium ions. Okay, they much prefer to let potassium ions move through than, for instance, other cations such as sodium or magnesium or calcium, okay, which are also present in non-insignificant amounts in physiological fluids. Okay, um, so how do voltage-gated potassium channels achieve that selectivity? Why do they much prefer to let potassium ions through? We will explore that by looking at the selectivity filter and the mechanism of permeation of potassium ions through the selectivity filter. Then finally, what we'll talk about is uh, inactivation of voltage-gated potassium channels. Okay, so uh, voltage-gated potassium channels uh, open upon depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. However, often they will close again before the membrane has depolarized. Uh, sorry before the membrane has been repolarized, okay? So, th they don't close necessarily because the membrane has repolarized, okay? They can, de they can close before the membrane has actually got around to repolarizing. So we want to look at what actually underlies that because it's a different mechanism, okay? And that's called inactivation of the voltage-gated potassium channels. So we'll look at a mechanism, N-type inactivation as it's called, uh, for the inactivation of voltage-gated potassium channels. Okay, right then, so we will begin with the action potential. Okay, so the action potential is a physiological phenomenon that uh, certain cells in the body display, okay, and the cells which are capable of an action potential are cells which have special voltage-gated ion channels in their cell membranes. Specifically, you need voltage-gated potassium channels, the topic of this video, but you also need voltage-gated sodium channels, which I'll abbreviate down to VGNCs. V for voltage, G for gated, N for sodium, C for channels. Okay, at least this is the case for the neurons, okay? Uh, so there are, uh, in the heart it's a little bit more complicated. The heart is, um, heart cells are another example of what are known as excitable cells, which are cells which are capable of uh, performing an action potential. Okay, uh, we're going to study specifically neurons rather than uh, cardiac muscle cells, okay, uh, which are another example of an excitable cell, so I'll just jot this down. So neurons are an excitable cell, and then uh, myocytes, not just cardiac myocytes, also skeletal myocytes, uh, they are capable of action potentials as well. We're going to look at what happens in neurons. Okay, and neurons have both voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels, and these are what are needed in order for you to be able to fire that action potential. Okay, right, so let me draw a picture then of a neuron. Okay, so I'll start uh, with the dendrites coming off the cell body. So these are the dendrites. So I, I'm just drawing a typical neuron. Okay, and a typical neuron looks like this. You have the dendrites coming off the cell body, like so, and then you have a large process coming off 
the cell body here, which is the axon, which will culminate with an axon terminal here. Okay, and here is the cell body. Uh, oh, sorry, this is the cell body with the nucleus. This specifically is the nucleus here, but the cytoplasm surrounding the nucleus here, along with the nucleus, is called the cell body. And there's a fancy piece of nomenclature for that. It's known as the soma. Okay, these structures here are the dendrites. Okay, coming off the soma. And then we've got the axon ending with an axon terminal. Okay, right. So let's discuss the generation of an action potential in this neuron. Now, generally an action potential begins at this uh, junction between the cell body here and the axon, okay? So there is a special name for this area here, okay? This is the area which generally starts the action potential, and the action potential will then propagate along the axon to the axon terminal. And this is what's known as the axon hillock, okay? So, why does the action potential only actually work in the axon, at starting with the axon hillock here? Well, the reasons are thought to be that only this portion of the neuron has enough voltage-gated ion channels of the sodium and potassium form for the action potential to actually operate here. The dendrites and the cell body portions, these portions of membrane are not believed to have the correct number uh, of voltage-gated ion channels for an action potential to actually be generated there. Okay, so the action potential usually begins in neurons at this beginning portion of the axon here, known as the axon hillock, and then is going to fire down the rest of the axon. Okay, right. So, um, the story of the generation of an action potential, however, doesn't actually begin with the axon hillock. To have a complete picture, we do need to look at what's happening at the dendrites, okay? So basically, the dendrites will have loads of little processes coming off them, like so, okay? Little processes that look like this, and these little processes have a special name, okay? These are known as dendritic spines. Okay, and the dendrites will be absolutely covered in these dendritic spines. I'm just too lazy to draw them. In reality, these dendrites that I've got here will be absolutely covered in these little mushroom-shaped processes coming off, known as the dendritic spines. And these dendritic spines are the places where other neurons are going to terminate on. Okay, so you're going to have another neuron here sending its axon terminal. And you'll notice how this axon terminal I draw much bigger. That's just the picture, basically. That's um, artistic license. Of course, this axon terminal would actually be the same size as the axon terminals of the other neurons as well, okay? Uh, so don't read too much into that. That's just the picture. So this is an axon terminal of another neuron, and it will synapse onto the dendritic spine, okay? And what it can do is it can release neurotransmitter onto this dendritic spine when an action potential arrives in the axon terminal. So when this neuron here fires an action potential down its axon, okay, which I'll colour in in red here, okay, that action potential will reach the axon terminal, and the axon terminal will then be triggered to release neurotransmitter onto the uh, dendritic spine membrane. The dendritic spine membrane will then have receptors for uh, that neurotransmitter. Now, in the brain, there are two main neurotransmitters used, okay? One is glutamate, and the other is GABA. Now, glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, okay? This one is the one which, if you release it onto a neuron, it makes that neuron more likely to fire an action potential. Okay, so this is an excitatory neurotransmitter, and it's the main one that's used within the brain. Okay, so most excitatory synapses in the brain will be using glutamate. Okay, GABA, on the other hand, is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter within the brain. Okay, if you release GABA onto a neuron, it means that that neuron will be less likely to fire an action potential. Okay, so... This neuron will have a huge number of synapses. It'll be covered in dendritic spines, it'll have loads of axons terminating on it and releasing glutamate or GABA. So you'll have loads of neurons which will be GABAergic, they'll be releasing a GABA and therefore will be inhibiting this neuron, and you'll have loads of 
neurons which will be glutamatergic, which will be releasing glutamate onto this neuron and therefore will be telling this neuron to fire an action potential. Now each neuron will either be GABAergic or glutamatergic. Okay, It's not like this neuron can decide one minute it's going to release glutamate, the other it's going to release GABA, it's fixed. It will either be exciting this neuron or inhibiting this neuron. Okay, so how then does glutamate and GABA actually cause these excitatory and inhibitory effects on the neuron's likelihood to fire an action potential? Well, basically, you have receptors on the postsynaptic membrane for glutamate or GABA, okay? So if I draw the axon terminal here, okay, and then we'll have the membrane of the dendritic spine here. Okay, and I'm sorry about this, but we're going to have to call it there for this video, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.